From Miami Law, I'm Annette Ugez, and this is The Explainer. But in terms of actual changes in the school system, it's getting worse. ProPublica recently released an exhaustive examination of racial disparities in educational opportunities and school discipline in America. In an episode we are calling State of Race, Acting Dean Osamuria James parses the widening gulf in American education. James is the creator of the Interdisciplinary University of Miami course, Race, Class, and Power, that examines the Black Lives Matter movement and racial justice in the United States. Let's go to Explainer producer Catherine Skip for the interview. Good morning, Ozamudia. Thanks for joining us at The Explainer. Thanks for having me, Catherine. We're looking at the Charlottesville School District and the work of ProPublica and the New York Times. Um, what in it stood out to you? So what sh- stood out to me most was how familiar the story was, what, how familiar the problem was on both a professional and a personal level. Um, the story ends with one of the students saying that she was told by a guidance counselor to consider community college despite her achievement. And um, that almost exact same thing happened to me in high school, even though it shouldn't have. And so I thought, gosh, we're still doing this. But then also professionally, I've studied this area my entire life in academia, and it hasn't changed. You have segregated housing, which leads to segregated schooling. We see it impacting quality of education in ways that are racialized and distinct from class issues. Um, When schools are integrated, we get second generation segregation in the schools where we use honors classes and gifted programs and special ed to again sort students out by race. We get parents who say they believe in equality, but they oppose attempts to integrate their schools or they just leave the system altogether if it doesn't go their way. Um, You know, disparate rates and discipline. It's just it's an ongoing issue. And nothing about the article surprised me, even though it did sadden me to, to see that we are still here. Are there any areas in which we're improving? No, unfortunately, I think um, so. I think the one area of improvement might be that we are having more of a conversation about it. Um, you know, this article came out. ProPublica is doing work. Nicole Hannah Jones of the New York Times has done a lot of work in this area. Um, has earned got a MacArthur grant for her work in this area, and so we're seeing a lot of scholarship and literature and discussion about it. Tanahisi Coates's piece a couple of years ago got a lot of attention and got people talking about it. But in terms of actual changes in the school system, it's getting worse. And so by some measures, we are more segregated today than we were at the time of Brown v. Board of Education. We don't see um, many schools affirmatively trying to integrate their schools. Um, The last of any schools that are under desegregation orders are being released from them. And in fact, diversity, which is the one last value that we're using to integrate schools, I think is on its way to the Supreme Court and will probably get struck down. So that's not very optimistic. I'm sorry. Chad, um, it seems like uh, in a lot of cases, the, the problems are worse in college towns. Can we talk a little about that? I thought that was fascinating. Um, and I think the article described it as in college towns, you have a lot of parents with a lot of resources and they invest very heavily in their kids' education, right? Especially to the extent that these are college professors and college administrators who sort of see the benefit of this. And so what you get is a disparity that's amplified because the top is so high up and maybe higher than relative, um, higher than uh, relative to other school districts. Um, but it's also really disheartening because these institutions are, are places with a wealth of expertise and people who know about the problem and institutions that are deeply embedded in the communities. And you think if there's a place where an institution could change this around, it would be where a university exists, but it's not. And you see this pattern a lot in a lot of town gown relationships. It's a strained relationship as opposed to one in which the university affirmatively addresses some of these issues. How can we fix that? fix the university, the town gown issue, or just sort of this issue more generally? Well, it would seem in a college town you have a lot of smart people that should have a lot of smart answers. So I think we know what the answers are. Um, You have to integrate public schools. You have to train faculty and teachers and administrators about the effect of implicit bias, about what it means to be racially isolated in your school. and we have to rethink some of the 
the structures that we use in schools that might not be working very well. If we know standardized tests have disparate impacts, and we have to think about why we're using the test and whether there are other ways to make sure students are getting what they need. Um, and so the question is not, do we know what works? The question is, how do we get the political will to change it? And that's going to require some parents giving up some claim to being ahead or privilege. Um, that's going to take some parents understanding that they are complicit in a problem, right, that is not necessarily of their own making, but that they contribute to. It's going to take people voting in politicians who are committed to this work. In the article, the superintendent gets kicked out in a year after she commissions an independent group to study race in the school system. And so if that keeps happening, it doesn't matter how much we know the answers we're not going to address the problem. No, one of the issues it brought up was these wealthy white parents are sending their kids to the best elementaries or the best preschools. They're taking them to Europe. They're exposing them to art. How do you fix that part of it where, where there's such a disparity in how the children are growing up? So I think there's two parts to this. One part is how do we make sure that all students are getting some sort of baseline experience across the board? Right? Some countries um, experiment with baby bonds, right? Or um, you know, a, um, a basic minimum income, right? Can we give people basic security that then allows them to experience these extracurricular things, maybe save for it or have someone sponsor them so they could get the extras that we can't always expect schools to provide. But the other issue is how do we make those extras less salient? It is great that I can travel to Europe and take my kids, but is it right that that somehow will limit opportunities in the classroom or somehow change my place in the school or make it harder for me to broaden my horizons. And if every child cannot do the extra lessons or the extra trips, are there ways we can broaden their horizons in the classroom or stop underestimating their ability just because they don't have those experiences? I don't think we're ever going to be able to prevent parents for doing more for their kids. And that's not a bad impulse, but the, the question is how do we limit the impact of that? How do we make this less of a race where people who get more of the goodies get further ahead? And how do we make sure everyone is getting the opportunities? And then the extras are the extras, and that's great, right? But no one is being denied access to challenging classes, teachers who believe in them, um, integrated activities after school, not being isolated you know, in the school, a curriculum that reflects you. Um, my extracurriculars might matter less if I saw myself in my curriculum more. Mm-hmm. I know one of the points that the the article in the Times brought up uh, is that the black kids are actually more tenacious mm -hmm. and harder working, that if they were given anywhere near the opportunity, the same opportunities, they would actually bypass a lot of the, the kids that are doing better than they are. Absolutely. That's an ethos I've always um, thought about in my own life, even though I am a person of color and I am a woman. I always think there are people who could do what I do. They just were not given the opportunity or had to overcome so much more. And the article references that um, in this context, that if you control for things like class, if you control for things like the college prep courses they're able to take, that those students are actually doing better than they might otherwise, right? If you compare them to white students who are in the same economic situation, for example. And this is actually a pattern that you see in lots of places in the criminal justice system. If you control for class, um, people of color actually commit less crime than white people in that same category, right? And so there's something about what people are overcoming when you put them through things over and over again that they don't get credit for. And so it was an interesting point in the article that these students are working harder than other people and not getting the full benefit of that extra work. So then how do we make sure that extra work results in outcomes that are favorable? How do we make it so that teachers see that extra work and give students opportunities to build on it? As opposed to thinking, oh, well, you know, this student is checked out because they didn't do it exactly the way you wanted. But in fact, they overcame 10 other things just to give you the minimum. You brought up that we have pretty much ground to a halt as far as reform goes. Are the reasons purely political? Are they partially part of the state? They Are they down to the district level? Like, where is the blame? So I think the blame exists at all levels. I think in general, education reform, whether at the federal level or the state level or the local level, has shifted from justice or equality to choice, right? We were going to reform the, the system by allowing people to choose their schools, and we're going to make schools like a market, and everyone will choose, and we'll all be happier, and the competition that we create will make schools better. And so once that 
and and that ethos has 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 taken over at every level. So this is um, No Child Left Behind. This is also Race to the Top, which is Obama's uh, signature education legislation. And then you see it at the district level, at the state level, states that are um, making it easier to, to establish charters in schools. You see at the district level, Miami-Dade is a, a choice school system, right? If there's space and you can get there, you can choose a different school. Um, but choice is not equality. Choice is not justice. And people have different levels of power on the education market. I put that in square, uh, scare quotes. And so it hasn't resulted in equality, even though it might make people feel better to say, oh, well, I chose this to the extent that you were even able to choose. Um, and then, um, so that's a national issue that's infiltrated through all the levels. Um, and, you know, that that's partially a political problem, right? How do our legislators and um, people who who regularly think about this problem. It's also how do parents think about this problem and what it is that parents demand. Um, if you demand choice, then we have that. But if you're demanding equality and you can place enough pressure on people in charge, then you might get a different outcome. Even though, as we see in this article, parents tried to put a lot of pressure, right? Just those 20 parents who tried to get their kids into a better school system and the other parents, I think the quote was freaked out, right? Did not want 20 black families in their school. And I'm sure those parents would never say that they, you know, were racist or or didn't believe in equality. Mm -hmm. um, I guess that brings me to, I know there's 14 states that have a two-tier diploma track. Mm -hmm. Unequal treatment? Look, the parents fought back because there's something valuable there, right? They want to be able to say that my kid has done more and that makes them more competitive. Um, and so to the extent that we're thinking about education as this, a prize that people with more power can get, right, as opposed to this thing that's good for all of us, I do think it creates an unequal system. But I'm less concerned about two tiers of diplomas in the abstract because it might be that some students are into education in a way that others aren't, and as long as everyone's at the minimal level, we can reward students who have been able to do more. The issue is who gets to do more and based on access to what resources. And so if you get to do more because you have more money, if you get to do more because you got access to the better school on the north side of town, if you get to do more because teachers looked at you and saw something in you and wanted to push you, um, and then other students did not get to do more because their schools didn't have the harder courses or their counselors didn't believe in you, or you go to a school that's under-resourced on the other side of town, that's where we get the problem. Um, and so if you can make sure everyone has the same opportunities, then we might feel less uncomfortable about the sorting that happens based on individual grit. But what this article and what most literature shows us is that this sorting happens with students regardless of what their intentional motivations are, regardless of how hard their parents fight, and unfortunately happens too often on the basis of what their skin color is and how much money they have. Mm -hmm. um, so obviously, Voting is one answer, but is there are there things that a single citizen can do to affect change? Absolutely. I think for a lot of people, this is about educating yourself on what exactly is going on, um, moving behind a knee-jerk assumption that your kid got ahead because they're great and someone else's kid didn't get ahead because they weren't great, to really think about how race and class are operating in your community, not just in your school system, but at your job. I often tell parents, if you look around and there are no children of color at your child's school, you need to say something about that. You need to talk to administrators and say, why is this so? And then do something differently about that. You have to be honest about how complicit am I in this system? Am I letting this go in ways that make it impossible for other people to get what I have or make it very difficult for other people to speak up? So I've talked a lot about this personally, the toll it takes for me to be right the angry lady, the angry black lady, talking about how come the school is segregated or how come we've excluded kids from lower income backgrounds. And that takes a toll on me and my family. I do it because I think it's right and because I understand the literature. But think about how much more powerful it would be if other parents were joining me, even if they had nothing personally to gain, um, other than knowing that they were pursuing something that was the right thing. Mm -hmm. Um, so what does change look like? Um, I think change looks like integrated public schools. 
Um, that happens to be tied to integrated communities. Um, but if you cannot change where people live, like I said, I think in Miami, something like 73% of residents would have to move if we wanted all our neighborhoods to reflect the overall demographic compositions of the city. Right? That's a lot of movement. Um, so if we can't get that sort of movement, then policies that lure parents out of private schools, um, improve local schools, and integrate those schools, whether it takes busing or lotteries, whatever it is, it's going to integrate our schools. Change also looks like ending second generation segregation in the school. So yes, your school is integrated, but are your extracurriculars segregated? Are your honors classes segregated? Are you putting all the kids of color in your special ed courses? You have to sort of interrogate and get rid of all of that. Change also looks like thinking harder about what a school system should be and how we should assess what students are doing and learning in the classroom. I mentioned before standardized testing. If you know that that tends to track by class or SES background, then you need to think differently about how By we, what background? I'm SES, sorry. SES, socioeconomic status. Then you have to change the way you know you test, especially if you're giving out goodies on the basis of that, of that test. Um, if you know teachers harbor explicit and implicit biases, then you have to train for that. And it can't just be one day that we do in the spring and everyone rolls their eyes, but rather when we train teachers, that has to be a core part of the curriculum. Anti-bias education also has to be part of the curriculum for students themselves. So that not only do they maybe recognize how they're ca caught up in this larger system that's askew, but so that our national conversation about race and inequality might be different. Because that's a big problem I see. Our political conversations are, they're thin and they don't lead to much because we do not have a shared vocabulary or national understanding about race, its history, and how it's still with us. Right. So if you start to teach kids that when they're younger, and they, they become adults who can talk about this, who don't run away in, um, in anger when someone suggested that they might be part of a larger problem that we need to fix and who then go out and engage in political activity, be it voting or just talking to the leaders in their community about what they're seeing, and that helps move us forward. Does this need to start at the top? Say it again. Does this need to start at the top? In the White House, in the Department of Education, in the Cabinet, in Congress? This is difficult because of how our education system runs. We do have, there's some federal control for education, especially when it comes to things like Title I funds, but in essence, each state sets its own curriculum and regulates its own education system. And so can people at the top um, sort of signal that we need to move in a direction or create incentives or encourage? Absolutely. But I don't think this is a problem that can be solved unless people at the bottom, and at the bottom I mean parents, faculty, um, administrators, if we don't start having conversations in our own communities about what it is we want to see. It doesn't take, there have been moments in our history where federal funding made a big difference, notably after Brown and student uh, schools were refusing to integrate. Brown, uh, the federal government said, well, great, it's been long enough, and if you don't integrate, you can't have this money, right? And very quickly, almost overnight, Southern schools in particular integrated. So there are ways you can create incentives or maybe use um, sticks, sticks and carrots, but there's also a conversation or action that has to happen at more local levels about what kind of community it is we want to see um, and what we're committed to creating for students to take advantage of so that they might go on and become productive citizens with as many opportunities as anyone else around them. Are there any school districts that are doing a particularly good job that other school districts could look to as a model where it's succeeding, where all the things that you want to happen or many of the things you want to happen are, are working and it's, it's not like, you know, towns, college towns that can't quite figure it out. Sure. I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, I think there were some systems that were working. So the Charlotte Mecklenburg system um, was very successful at this for a very long time until the board, to be frank, sort of got got taken over by people who were opposed to the politics of integration, and it started to fall apart. And very quickly, you saw a slide. They had been closing the gap steadily, and almost immediately, you saw a widening of that gap again once they abandoned that commitment. Um, Louisville, Kentucky, Seattle, Washington, those are two cities that were committed to this and so used a commitment to diversity 
to inform school assignments so that schools ended up more integrated. They got slapped down by the Supreme Court as you know, not being able to, to use it. And so not being able to use diversity as sort of their hook. And so, I mean, to be clear, actually, the court sort of passed in the question of diversity. They ignored that question and instead just said, well, we don't think these plans are narrowly tailored enough and you need to do something different, right? This is not a plan that we would approve. Um, and those schools, again, sort of slid back into segregation. So I don't know, you know, I don't know of any communities that are getting it right. Um, I think probably the communities are going to do the best are the ones that happen to be integrated from the start. And so the answer might be, how do we get policymakers to start incentivizing integration where people live such that schools are then better integrated as a result um, and that people are invested in staying in that community? Because what we see sometimes is that the neighborhood is integrated, but white parents nevertheless pull their kids out of the public schools and send them someplace else um, because they're using race as a proxy. If there are too many people of color, they've decided these schools can't be good, even when the data shows that the things they care about, like test scores and extracurriculars, suggest that the school is exactly what they're looking for, STEM programs, and none of that is enough. And so, um, you know, integrated neighborhoods would be a start. And I've often wondered why school districts don't work harder with housing authorities to make sure that we have better integration. Mm -hmm. um, anything you want to add in closing? Okay, I, I think the, the, the last thing I would add, or I would just reemphasize this idea about thinking about what justice looks like as opposed to what diversity looks like or what choices look like. Um, diversity is great. Thinking across difference, talking to people who have different experiences or backgrounds from you is a very important thing, but that is neither, um, it's not sufficient um, and it's not justice. And not one month a year. Exactly, exactly, right, around a particular holiday. Um, that's not what's right. And so thinking about what is right, um, what do children in our country deserve? How do we educate them in ways that move our country forward, that strengthen our democracy? And how do we ensure that the legacy of things like race doesn't continue to dictate life outcomes, right? Not because that's good for diversity, but because that's the right thing to do. Um, and I really want to encourage people to think about that. Diversity is not justice. Um, and we need to be led by a commitment to justice. Perfect. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed this. Thanks for joining us for another episode of The Explainer. Next week, Children and Youth Law Clinic Director Bernard Perlmutter will be in our studios probing the legal issues ahead for the children of the caravans. I'm your host, Annette Uguez. Today's show was brought to you by Miami Law's Investor Rights Clinic, the only securities arbitration clinic in Florida providing free assistance to small claim investors. The clinic has recovered more than $1 million for its clients. To learn more about the clinic, visit law.miami.edu and search for investor rights. Thank you.